From CPRI and the CPRI Knowledge Hub, this is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research in education. Today we look at dual credit courses, offered in high school as a way for students to experience and complete college-level coursework before graduation. They aim to provide students access to advanced learning experiences that could help them prepare academically for the rigors of college, and then perhaps reduce costs of college through early credit accumulation. In a new study co-authored by UNC Chapel Hill's Stephen Hemmelt, researchers conducted the first ever randomized controlled trial examining the effects of dual credit math courses on high school and college outcomes, including college enrollment and course taking behavior. Hemmelt joined CPRI Knowledge Hub managing editor Keith Hummiller to discuss their findings. It shifted them away from the two-year sector and toward four-year universities. And that substitution was clearest for students in the middle 50%. And some important implications for education policy, practice, and future research. So this approach offers an alignment framework that other states might want to consider or think about how it might function in their own context. That's right now on Research Minutes. Hello and welcome to Research Minutes. I'm Keith Hummeller, Managing Editor of the CPRI Knowledge Hub. Today I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with uh, Stephen Hemmelt, Associate Professor of Public Policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Thanks so much for joining us, Steve. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So today we're discussing your new study. It was co-authored with Brown University's Nathaniel Schwartz and the University of Michigan's Susan Donarski, uh, titled Dual Credit Courses and the Road to College, Experimental Evidence from Tennessee. Uh, it was recently published in the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management, and it involves the first randomized controlled trial to examine the effects of dual credit math coursework on a range of high school and college outcomes. But to start, for those who may not be completely familiar, could you just uh, explain what dual credit courses are and how prevalent they are in U.S. schools? Sure. So the terms dual credit and dual enrollment are used in flexible and pretty overlapping ways by scholars and policymakers. For today's discussion, we should really think of dual credit courses as those that offer a student the chance to earn both high school and college credit for a course before graduating high school. And so these courses aim to do two things. They aim to provide students access to advanced learning experiences that could help them prepare academically for the rigors of college, and then perhaps reduce costs of college through early credit accumulation. And these umbrella terms, dual credit, dual enrollment, they capture newer kinds of dual credit courses like the ones we study in Tennessee, as well as things that have been around for a while, like advanced placement courses that have targeted typically top performers in high school, as well as dual enrollment partnerships, which are usually between particular high schools and colleges where students can physically go over to a college campus and take a course. These dual enrollment programs vary widely across states and localities in terms of implementation details. So whether the course counts for high school credit as well, how the costs are apportioned across students, colleges, and districts, and other ways as well. In terms of prevalence, recent national data show that the vast majority of public schools offer some form of these early post-secondary experiences, but the specific mix of what's available varies. And pretty recent data indicate that about a third of students report taking a course for post-secondary credit while they're in high school, but there are important gaps in participation and access across subgroups of students. For example, 42% of students from families with a college-educated parent of such a course, while only 33% of students from families where the parent's highest level of education was a high school degree did so. White students are more likely to report taking such courses than their Black and Hispanic peers, and so these access and and availability gaps are important to understanding the landscape of, of prevalence. That sounds like it might be a partial answer to my next question, but I'm curious, uh, what drew you to this line of research, both in general and specifically there in Tennessee? Um, Were there specific elements of the state's dual credit policies that lent themselves to a trial like this, or were there gaps in the literature, outstanding questions regarding the effects of dual credit courses that you were were hoping to answer? 
I'm broadly interested in, in factors that enhance or impede students' progress through schooling and their ability to acquire useful knowledge and skills, especially during transition points. So, for example, from, ho- from high school to college. I'm also interested in how policies and programs affect opportunities and success for traditionally underserved groups of students. And this particular study in Tennessee was, was born out of a, a moment of opportunity. So the state was launching a number of new dual credit courses, and the Department of Education was building capacity to serve lots of interested schools and also wanted to learn about the causal effects of these new courses on student outcomes. So we were able to team up and randomize the rollout of one of the very first dual credit courses, which was this advanced algebra course. And in terms of Tennessee's education policy landscape, it's important to understand that these statewide dual credit courses were a part of a larger effort by the state to grow the menu of what they call early post-secondary opportunities for students, which would include things like AP courses, the dual enrollment relationships between high schools and colleges that I mentioned earlier, as well as these statewide dual credit courses, which we study, one of, um, in the paper we're talking about today. And these new courses, they they had a focus on reaching middle achieving students, as well as racial and ethnic groups underrepresented in college, and are a bit different from the kinds of other dual enrollment, dual credit interventions or initiatives studied in the literature. And so relative to those elsewhere, they share some things in common with dual enrollment, some with AP, but unlike AP, were targeted toward these more middle achieving students on the margins of college going. And the state was hoping to attract more diverse swath of students. So the courses vary in content from algebra, the one we studied in the pilot, to sociology, to plant science. And in particular, Tennessee's dual credit courses are developed by teams of high school teachers and college instructors of the same subject area. So these teams come together, say around college algebra or around advanced algebra, and they produce standards, curricular standards that are aligned to the post-secondary level to what the student would be expected to know in college about that topic. And then teachers receive summer trainings on those standards before going back to their high school and offering the dual credit version of the course within the walls of Tennessee high school. And then students have the opportunity to earn or sort of bank college credits based on their performance on, the, on an end of course centrally graded exam that students in the dual credit courses take. And so you'll see some of those elements of both dual enrollment, AP reflected, and then by state statute, all public colleges in Tennessee are required to accept passing scores on those tests for degree bearing credit. And in practice, many of the privates did too. The state hoped that this would be a pretty portable form of credit earned during high school. And to your last question about holes or things we were trying to, to learn or, or add to knowledge, there's not a ton of work on the causal effects of dual credit courses. And there's no work on this particular form of statewide team-created dual credit coursework that Tennessee unleashed in the you know, 2013 forward. And so that was a hole we were hoping to fill. As we mentioned at the top, this was the, the first study of its kind uh, in, in this arena. Could you just uh, give us a general overview of, of your approach and, and the scope of your work here? Sure. So the Tennessee Department of Education was a fantastic partner. I mean, they, they care so much about using careful research to inform practice and policymaking with the ultimate goal of, of increasing student success and well-being. And we, we focused this study, as I said, on one of the initial dual credit courses, this, this advanced algebra math dual credit course. And so a sizable number of schools were interested in piloting that course. The state needed to build capacity to support wider implementation of that course and others moving forward and wanted to learn about the effects. So we solicited interest from across the state, which resulted in a bit more than 100 schools who were interested in this dual credit math course. And then in the 13-14, 2013-14 academic year, we randomized those schools to treatment and control groups. And so randomization here ensures that the schools and the eligible students who were able to, who were situated and able to take this class across both groups are similar in ways we can see, like prior math achievement or experience with other kinds of coursework. 
as, as well as those we cannot, like motivation. And so therefore, any differences that we see later in outcomes between the treatment schools and the control schools have to be because of this new dual credit math course and not due to other features of the schools or the students. And so that was the design of the study that allowed us to be able to talk about causal effects of the availability of this new course and of taking this course on later outcomes. So students in the treatment group had access to the course, the associated end of course exam. Teachers in those schools had access to the summer trainings on the college aligned standards. And then control schools didn't have access to those things during the pilot period. And once the pilot period ended, which was two years, there were any interested schools in the state could take up that course. And all the while, other courses in other areas were being developed. So we follow those two groups over time through the end of high school and into college using detailed administrative data from several sources. And we focused on 11th and 12th graders because those are the grades that constitute the overwhelming majority of students in dual credit courses. And one neat part that we did as a supplementary piece was we also surveyed teachers in the treatment and control school of these math courses. So in the treatment schools, teachers are teaching the dual credit version largely, and in the control schools, they're teaching the version that was there before. And we were wondering, well, are there any in-classroom differences? So what on the ground might be different in terms of content coverage or materials or approaches between the dual credit version and the, and the regular version? And the state developed dual credit courses in a lot of other areas as well. Uh, some additional math courses, courses in the social sciences like psychology, sociology, as well as courses with more of a career and technical education focus like agricultural business and plant science. So one important limitation of our study to keep in mind is that we focus on one dual credit math course. Moving forward, it will be important to understand if we see similar results for dual credit courses in different subject areas. And in terms of this study, uh, your your team reports a few different findings, including that uh, some dual credit math courses can lead to notable changes in student course taking behavior. Um, could you walk us through what you learned? Yes. So we found that the dual credit math course reduced the likelihood of enrollment in remedial math and boosted enrollment in more rigorous math courses, such as pre-calculus and AP math courses. We didn't find an effect on overall rates of college enrollment of the course. However, participation in the course altered college decisions for some students. And in particular, for some, it shifted them away from the two-year sector and toward four-year universities. And that substitution in college choices was clearest for students in the middle 50% of the baseline achievement distribution, so that middle achieving group, as well as those who were exposed to the opportunity to take the course for the first time in 11th grade rather than 12th grade. And so if you knit those findings together, it tells the story of the dual credit math course shifting some middle achieving 11th graders into higher level math courses in 12th grade, including AP math in some cases, and then shifting college enrollment toward the four-year sector. So I'm curious uh, what you think the implications of this work might be particularly given the debates we often hear about the benefits and potential drawbacks of dual credit offerings in high school and the rise that we've recently seen in things like early college high school programs, dual enrollment programs, community college partnerships and the like. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's, there's tremendous variety in these new waves of, of early post-secondary experiences. And in one sense, these innovations provide great opportunities for researchers and practitioners to partner and learn more about how they affect students, teachers, and schools. And the dual credit courses we studied are a much lighter dose, say, compared to the more intensive interventions you mentioned, like early college high schools, which essentially embed two years of college into high school, often with additional supports. And so for our study, there are a few implications I'd mentioned first that Dual credit math coursework aligned to college level expectations has the potential to enhance students' academic skills and subsequently shape their college choices. There's other research that finds benefits to students on the margin of college preparedness of starting at a four year institution rather than a two year in terms of the likelihood of completion. And second, in our study, we didn't see evidence that the dual credit math course acted as a competitor 
for AP math courses, which is something the state was interested in. How do we think about the multiple opportunities that are out there for students targeting different student groups, but all there together? And so we looked at that and what we saw was that the dual credit math course was drawing middle and upper middle achieving students and was not siphoning off a would-be AP students in, in, in a sense. And therefore, at least in terms of this one study and this one math, math course, that suggests the potential that AP math and dual credit math could function as complementary policy strategies for offering students a range of early post-secondary options. And then third, I want to flag the manner in which Tennessee thought about and created these dual credit courses. So they they facilitated what I'd say is a more structural reform to the secondary, post-secondary alignment process. That is, they brought together high school teachers and post-secondary instructors in the same subject area. So there was a team for algebra. There's a team for sociology. There's a team for agricultural business. And those teams developed the aligned standards. And then those courses were implemented. And so in our study of the dual credit algebra course, we saw some evidence that this translated down to the classroom level. If you recall those surveys I mentioned earlier, we, we see in data from those surveys that treatment group teachers covered different concepts at different paces and used somewhat different assignments than their counterparts in the control schools. And so that, that suggests that this alignment process shaped instruction in a way that was different than what was happening happening before. And so this approach offers an alignment framework that other states might want to consider or think about how it might function in their own, in their own context. You had mentioned earlier that this is a, a relatively understudied area of education here in the U.S. Um, so I'm curious, uh, do you think that there are opportunities here for future research, either for you and your team or for others who are working in this area? Definitely. There's a lot of opportunity for future research. We, there's lots we still don't know, and states are trying out new forms and features of these dual and credit, new forms and features of these dual credit opportunities. In 2019, 37 states considered legislation that dealt with themes related to dual credit or enrollment, and 23 of them enacted new bills. And so the policy variation is, is out there and, and ripe for teams to explore. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of particular steps forward, one important step will be to explore the effects of dual credit courses in non-math subject areas. We're seeing in some related work of our own that courses in different areas attract different kinds of students. And so we might not expect results to be the same, or, or maybe they are similar, and, and we don't know. And so that's an important area. We also know very little about which forms of the experience that worked best for which kinds of students. So that is, how do any effects of these dual credit courses vary by location? So whether the course is offered within the walls of high school, like the one we studied, or if students go to a college campus and the course is offered there. What about the type of instructor? Do effects vary by whether the student is taught by a high school teacher with whom they are familiar, but the content is different, or a college instructor? And then subject area as well. In terms of our own work, we're wrapping up two related pieces of research on Tennessee's statewide dual credit initiative. So the first is a, is a deep descriptive study of the rollout of the suite of dual credit courses over the first four years of implementation. And so we're studying patterns of student and school level participation in these courses. Who did the courses reach? What types of schools and students participated in them? And did those patterns reflect the hopes and aspirations of policymakers? And finally, how do those patterns differ by subject area of the course, as I mentioned? And the second is a close look. We're zeroing in on one part of the dual credit course package that is of interest to both the state and academic literature, which is the causal effects of what we're calling banking college credit. So that is barely passing that end of course challenge exam on measures of early college success, such as credit accumulation and GPA. Pass rates on those exams have been pretty low so far, and it's not clear how securing that credit shapes the early college experiences of students. And that's an important piece of these courses that we can learn more about. And so if other contexts have these kinds of features, that's an opportunity as well to see how they influence student outcomes. 
Well, this is just incredible work, Stephen, and I, I want to encourage all of our listeners to go and read the full article. Uh, again, it's titled Dual Credit Courses and the Road to College Experimental Evidence from Tennessee. It was just published in the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management. Uh, Stephen Hemmel, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot. It was great to chat with you. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. For more episodes of this podcast, or to subscribe to the series, visit us at researchminutes.org. To share your thoughts on today's episode, or to suggest future topics, follow us on Twitter at CPRI Hub. That's C-P-R-E Hub. <laughs>